The Lawrence Sanders Prize is bestowed annually by the Creative Writing Program at Florida International University to a writer of fiction whose work reflects the highest literary merit and which has gained wide popular appeal. After all, it is the state admission of the Master of Fine Arts program at FIU not to impose some writing doctrine upon our students, but to admit writers of obvious talent and spend the ensuing three years helping them to connect with the audience they wish to find. Expressing oneself is only half the equation. Connecting to an audience is the other half. As I often remind my students, the only place people read books that they are not interested in is in college. <laughs> I, for one, have never aspired to write books that people would be required to read. In any case, Dan Brady and the Sanders Foundation thought the idea a good one. And here we are, gathered tonight for the presentation of the third annual Sanders Prize. The first recipient was Scott Turow, and last year's award was received by Pat Conroy. We think we have established quite a track record, and we thank you again, Dan Brady and the Sanders Foundation. I told Chauncey May, former books editor at the Sun Sentinel and author of an excellent piece about Miss Yende in last weekend's paper, that given her stellar critical reputation and her enormous worldwide appeal, that Isabelle Yende is the very model of the writer we had in mind when this award was conceived. I could not be happier that she has made her way to South Florida, and it was not easy <laughs> to accept. At this point, I would like to call up Vice Provost for the Biscayne Bay Campus and longtime supporter of the Creative Writing Program, Dr. Stephen Mall, to present Miss Allende with the Archie. And what he has in that unlocked briefcase is a statuette executed by noted third generation sculptor Ignacio Castaneda of Mexico City. Dr. Ma. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Stanford, who 48 hours ago received the Outstanding University Professor Award. For the best of the best. Sure knows how to pick the finest writers, not in the country, but in the world. Isabel Allende, world-class author and journalist, Florida International University salutes you. You weave together the elements of fantasy, myth, and realism to override time and place in a genre known as magic realism. Your life experiences have become part of the family of literature for hundreds of millions of people worldwide. With 19 books in print, 57 million copies in 35 languages, you have left an indelible mark on the late 20th and early 21st century fiction. Because of your world-class status, FIU, our World's Ahead University <laughs> honors you with the third annual Lawrence A. Sanders Award for Fiction, the Archie Award. Congratulations.
Thank you very much, Dr. Mom. At this time, I would like to call up my colleague Deborah Dean, herself the author of a novel acclaimed worldwide, and that is The Madonnas of Leningrad. She's also <laughs> the latest edition has the encomium of a very well-known author, I might uh, add, on its cover. She, Deborah is also the author of a collection of short stories called The Confessions of a Falling Woman, and she has a second novel coming out this fall, also set in Russia, The Reflected World. The Mirrored World. The Mirrored World. Well, it's closed. <laughs> Maybe we were arguing about that time, The Mirrored World. Deborah, whom I also want to thank for her tireless work in making this evening possible, will have a few words of her own to say about our honored guest, and then she will proceed to sit down and have what I know will be a lively conversation with her about matters literary and, I don't know, maybe matters not so literary as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Dean. I'm going to start, I'm going to be a den mother first of all and ask you all if you haven't turned off your cell phones and put them to a silencer, if you would do that now, that would be great. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention right away, as long as we're doing business, you you got little three by five cards when you came in through the door, yes? And those, I'm going to sit down, I get to monopolize some of Isabel's time here, and I have questions, a whole bunch of questions to, to ask her. But if you have a question also to ask her, go ahead and use that card and write the question down. And later on, we'll have assistants that will collect them, and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. So on behalf of the FIU Creative Writing Program, it is just such a great honor this evening for me to introduce Isabel. Um, it's also, I have to say, an exercise in superfluity. Uh, most everybody in this room not only knows who she is and what she has written, but I think also feels as though they have a close personal relationship with her. Um, the secretary in our department who was taking reservations this week remarked to me how many people called and said, I am her most ardent fan. <laughs> and I am her biggest admirer. Uh, and, and you know, that's how it is with some rare artists. They reveal themselves to us so open-heartedly that we come to think of them as intimates. That they are, we've shared moments of joy and moments of sorrow with them. And they've told us all of their secrets. And Isabel is such a writer. She is the supreme storyteller. A Latin Scheherazade. And she draws us in with her first few words, and she keeps us up late into the night, mesmerized by the whispering in her ear. And as a consequence, the world is full of her friends and readers. And I won't, I won't go over, you stole some of my statistics, so I won't, I won't repeat them. Um, she, she must have a storage unit somewhere in, in California to hold all of the honors and the awards, including 12 <coughs> honorary doctorates, I think. Um, but I think this may be one of her favorites in that she was um, in the 19, 2006 Winter Olympics in Turin, Italy. She represented Latin America as one of five of the flag bearers in the opening ceremonies. As she tells it, she was trotting behind Sophia Loren. Between her legs. <laughs> What is telling about these many honors and awards, though, is that they are not only for her writing, but also for her contributions to making the world a better place. One of the vehicles of this largesse is the Isabel Allende Foundation, created to honor her daughter Paola and to support the empowerment of women and girls worldwide. On top of being a kick-ass writer, she is beautiful and generous and funny and smart, and I'm humbled to share a stage with you. We get a phallic microphone. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I have to 
tell you, Isabel, that one of the uh, first things that Mitchell Kaplan tried to prepare me for was your coming. And I didn't really fully realize until this last month what a phenom you are. And I kept thinking of Margaret Mitchell, the author of Gone with the Wind, who said famously that it was a full-time job just being the author of Gone with the Wind, and that it left her no time to write anything else. And I'm thinking a similar thing could probably be said, that it must be a full-time job just being Isabella Andy, and yet you've written 19 books. And, and averaging, I, I did the math, uh, one every 18 months or so. Oh my god. Why yeah. every 18 months? I hadn't got You, you didn't do the math. I did no. because I've only got three books. <laughs> So I don't know how you do it, and, and I'm not simply talking about time, I'm talking about that, that private space that we need to, to create that's so different from, from this. Yeah, you know, uh, once I heard a writer say, um, a male writer, say that in order to be a novelist, you need a very good wife. <laughs> I have a very good wife. <laughs> He's called Willie Gordon, and he really makes my life easy. And I have two other people that help me. My daughter-in-law, Lori, who's sitting there, and she runs my life, my foundation, and the family. And my assistant, Juliet, who uh, is like a shield that sort of protects me. But the thing is that I have so many stories that I don't have time to tell them. So if I give myself a few months every year, and I do that every year at the beginning of the year, I, I always have a thousand stories to tell. I'm never running out of ideas. Well, I, I have a question for you about January 8th. But um, first you should explain the significance of that before I ask the question. Well, I, I start all my books on January 8th. Um, because people think that it's just superstition. It is, partly. But it's also discipline. If I have... Um, a day in, wh in which I start, all my life is prepared for that day. Can you imagine what January 7th looks like in my house? <laughs> I'm a wreck. And, uh, but starting January 8th, no one calls me. There are no invitations. I don't go anywhere. And I, I lock myself in a little house in the back of the, of the garden. It's supposed to be the pool house. And there, I don't have email, I don't have fax, I don't have telephone, I'm just alone with my dictionaries and, and the research that I've done. So it's wonderful, just wonderful. But, now, but let me tell you, okay. that I wrote, I wrote The House of the Spirits, I had a, a day job, 12 hours a day, two jobs. And then I would come home and work in a little portable typewriter in the kitchen. It was the time when you had to put paper inside a typewriter, <laughs> you know what that is, and then type, and if you made a mistake, there was something called typex that you could paint, that you would paint the word. And to give you an example, th there are three copies, you know, you had to correct the copies too. The third copy you could hardly see because it was, you, couldn't, you couldn't even read it. And to give you an example, when I wrote The House of the Spirits, the villain was called Count the Big, the Big Bear. And my mother, when she read the manuscript, said, why did you give this Count the villain your father's name? <laughs> and I didn't know that my, I didn't know my father, but I didn't know that my father's second name was Big Bear. So my mother said, you have to take that out. <laughs> yeah, very easy. <laughs> but go, page by page. First of all, find the name that has the same number of letters. <laughs> go with typex, erase the space. Put it back in the in one page by page. It took like a month. Just <laughs> so life is very easy today. Anybody can write a novel. <laughs> novels take a year? That took a year, but I was writing only at night, uh -huh. because I, I had a day job. Now that I don't have a day job, it takes me not a long time to write, but a long time to research. Uh, for example, um, I wrote a, a, a historical novel about Haiti. I don't remember the name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't believe the scene. <laughs> uh, I am beneath the sea. It took me four years to research, but only a few months to write it. 
So I was going to ask you, because I just assumed my novels take me forever, what, what do you do if you're done in March? I wait. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> of course, I wait until the next year. I can be researching. I always think of the research as foreplay. So, uh, <laughs> writing the novel won't take that long, it's like intercourse, but, uh, <laughs> 11 minutes, but, <laughs> but researching is an interesting part of the whole I, I love researching. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, 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 I love Copeland. <laughs> Um, you've written, beginning writers are advised to write what they know, and you did that when you were beginning with the House of the Spirits, uh, but you've also written historical fictions, in other words, you've written what you don't know, and done the research and gone and found out, and I was wondering if you had a preference for one over the other. I like to write fiction better than non-fiction, because I'm a born liar. And so whatever I write as a memoir is packed with lies. I, I, I'm not even aware that they are lies. Really, I'm not. I, I think that it's true because, the, you know, really, if you think of your memory of what you remember, are you sure that it happened that way? Maybe your sister who was there remembers something quite different. So memory is very similar to fiction. You, you highlight certain things. You, you keep other things in the darkness, you choose the adjectives in which you will tell your own life. Uh, so I am not aware that I'm writing fiction, but because my memoirs are about my family, everybody else gets pissed. <laughs> so uh, so I, I don't know, I'd rather write, write fiction. And, I and don't, 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 they, don't, they see in, don't they see themselves in the fiction as well? Yeah, but... but it's not there. You've got plausible deniability, right? Yes. Now, I wanted to ask you, how did you end up writing a, The Madonnas of Leningrad? A book that has nothing to do with you. <laughs> I don't, I think, I, and I'm not being, I'm not being um, humble here. I don't think there's three people in this room that came to hear about my books. Um, although, if there are, you're welcome to give me a call and, you know, we'll have coffee. And I'll, and I'll yak away. Um. <laughs> Not really. Because if you ask about historical fiction or about what the things that we write about. Why do we end up writing that book? Yeah, I have no why? idea. A book that, why did I write about Haiti? I have nothing in common with Haiti. Not culturally, not the language, not, not the background. There were no slaves in Chile at the time. So I wrote a book about slavery. <laughs> what is it? What is that seed that we have inside that starts to grow and grow like a tumor and at the end it's suffocating you mm -hmm. and you end up writing? For you, Leningrad, you're going to write a second book about Leningrad. I have know. you ever been in Leningrad? I, yes, <laughs> once after I wrote the book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah. Why does that happen to writers? There's, you, you find something. I, I tried to be controlling about what I wrote. And, and said, no, I don't want to write this, I want to write that. And, and, I, and I tried to write a book that was set in Seattle, which is where I'm from, because I thought it would be easier. And it just would not. It just wouldn't happen, and it was dying on the table, and, and I had a contract for it. And, wow. and I, was, I was terrified because I'm such a Girl Scout. And there was this other book set in Russia, you know, that story that just kept saying, come, come write me, come write me. And so, you know, eventually you follow the muse, right? Mm -hmm. But about you. <laughs> um, do you, do you have any trouble when you're writing about something like Haiti or, or uh, the gold rush? Keeping from, you, we find out all of this wonderful stuff, do you have trouble keeping it from taking over the story? The research can take over because sometimes you have too much. And, um, but it's easier to cut and to just let, let it, leave it out. For me, what is fascinating in the research is if I can find a person who lived the experience or letters that were written at the time, anything that is contemporary to the time. What is that? Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> what is that? It's a fire alarm? It's a battery? Does somebody have? <laughs> Did we not change the batteries? 
That's magic realism. I always hear that kind of stuff. Always. Some weird noise. Okay, I'm going to try and ignore it. Yeah. Ignore it for the moment. But it doesn't matter to you. Yeah. If it's not dangerous, it doesn't matter. It's not a bomb or something. <laughs> Look at the face of the security guard. Yes. <laughs> Well, as long as we're stopped for this moment, did, did you write down some questions? Yes? yes? Uh, Pass them over. Wave, wave the hands, and there's assistants that will come around and collect cards and, and bring them up, and we'll, we'll throw some of your questions into the mix. But I've got a couple of more here that I just have to ask her. Um, I, I know that you are in a, you're in a two-writer household now. Your husband, William C. Gordon, yeah. is a writer. And I'm, I'm in a two two writer household. My husband yes, is a poet. Yes, but when you met him, he was a poet. When I met mine, he was a lawyer. No, no, my, <laughs> he was a lawyer. And, and then he retires and decides to write books to compete with me. What is he thinking? What is he thinking? And so I said, when I retire, I will be a lawyer. <laughs> So now he's writing these shitty novels, and, and he's getting a lot of good, good reviews, and he's selling them, and I'm really angry. I married a poet, so that's that's. It. Although he wasn't a poet when I met him, but but what I was going to ask you about is the the two writer marriage, which is a dangerous thing, and Cliff is also my first reader. He reads everything. And he's my in-house editor. The the same the reverse cannot be said. I am not allowed to read his poetry except and when I am, it's only to make punctuation suggestions. <laughs> but I was wondering, do you do you share your writing with him or does he share it with you? We write very different books. Mm -hmm. He writes uh, mysteries, and I'm I don't know anything about writing mysteries. Um, we don't we don't edit each other's books because he thinks that he speaks Spanish <laughs> and, uh, and he writes in English and I write in Spanish so I wouldn't dare edit a book in English and he can't read my books until they are translated so it takes a while but we talk about the stories and, and we talk about scenes and sometimes he has a suggestion he, can, I, he comes up with an incredible lawyer's memory he can remember all kinds of bullshit <laughs> and little minutia that you wouldn't believe. He can remember the phone number of his first lover in LA. <laughs> and uh, so he, he can give me ideas, and, and I can give him some ideas. He wrote a first novel um, when he retired. It was just awful. <laughs> it was the story of an oversexed dwarf. <laughs> Politically incorrect. <laughs> Who is, first of all, no woman in her right mind would sleep with this guy. And then, who's going to publish this book with this title, The Oversex Dwarf? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I convinced him that that was a trunk novel. That we could go into. Everybody has a trunk novel. And then I said, well, Why don't you start writing what you know about? And that is mysteries because you've been a lawyer, you know about crime, you've been, he's almost a criminal. <laughs> and, and, and you know about forensic law. So, I just started doing that and he really has a, has a vocation, I would say. <laughs> so, you, you brought up the translations and I have a question for you about that. Your most recent book, uh, El Coderno de Mayo, came out, what, last July yeah. in Spanish? And from what I can tell, the English translation, Maya's notebook, is, still doesn't have a launch date? No, because um, I, I had a translator that worked with my books for 30 years, Petch Peden, and she's now 84 or 85. Yeah. She has an aneurysm, and she can't um, translate. And El Cuaderno de Maya is a very young story. It's the story of a 19-year-old girl from Berkeley. So it's a very contemporary and very um, fast-paced book. And she said, I'm just too old for this. I don't get the, the rhythm. And so she, she didn't, she started and then she said, I can't do it. 
So we looked for another translator and we found a wonderful woman who translates perfectly, but it takes her forever. She's like the plumber, you know? And you call the plumber, and they, he comes, breaks up everything in your house, and he has another job in another place. And then six months later, he comes back. That's the way it So I have got no idea when it will come out in English. Are, are you at all tempted to just translate it yourself? I would. Really? No. I'm, I'm sadly monolingual, and I, and I always have this sort of paranoid assumption that my books in translation are just really, really dreadful. Let go. Let go of that, because they are awful. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You, don't, you can't read them, and you don't know what other people So that's a blessing, actually. It's a blessing. I, I think it's a blessing. So I get pirated copies of my books in languages that I didn't know existed, in continents that I didn't know existed. <laughs> that to me is the no control over life. How can you have control over your writing? Well, I've been finding people that speak the languages and asking them, is this any good? But they can't know, because yeah. they don't know what you wrote. That's true. <laughs> and then they, they always say yes. You know, I, I heard uh, that uh, this thing about translation and, and the pirated edition, all, all of that, that we try to control, is so crazy that there was someone that, I mean, in, in China, they published the seventh Harry Potter book before it was written. So there was a Chinese guy somewhere in an attic writing another Harry Potter. And that was published. So can't control life. So so you have this wonderful translator, that English translator that's been working with you for years. And even so, am I missing what am I missing when I read it in translation? Language is like blood. It's very personal. And, and it's, it's, it's more than the language, it's the culture. When Pablo Neruda writes a poem, an ode to bread, it's untranslatable. Because bread, in some cultures, is life. It's what gives life. Here, it's a white bread, like you buy a table. It doesn't have the same meaning. And so it's, I think that you can translate the, the plot, you can, you can really convey the story, you can convey the, the, the characters, but there is something that is always different. I don't think it's missed, it's just different. Do we, do we have some cards here? Let me see what, we, what other questions we've got here. If there's some in Spanish, I can, I can get them. It's three in Spanish. Three in Spanish. If I write in English or Spanish? Of course in Spanish. I do all the important things in my life in Spanish. <laughs> I do. You know, it's, as I've said, it's like blood. I cook, I write, I make love in Spanish. Can you imagine panting in English? It sounds so weird. Absolutely weird. That's why I say that my husband thinks that he speaks Spanish. <laughs> oh, here's a, here's a good one. You'll like this one. Your book, uh, Cuatos del... Let's see now, Del Luna, uh, is of high erotic content. Why haven't you repeated this high erotic content in the rest of your novels? Four forms. <laughs> I'm old. At the time I was living in Venezuela, I was in my 30s or 40s or whatever, I was still hot at the time. <laughs> now it would be an exercise in imagination. <laughs> uh, here's a question, an interesting question. If you could go back to the most crucial moments in your life, what would you change? What you make, would you make different? And what you regret what things that I have done, I regret. This is a very serious question, and it's very interesting, because um, when I, I have started from scratch in my life many times. I have left everything behind and start anew. And every time I think I can reinvent myself, that I can create a new story of myself, and, and leave in the past or, or, or forget forever, certain things and, 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 and make up other things that will make me greater. 
And every time that, that exercise lasts a very brief moment, because you always carry the person you are within your skin. And there's no way that you can change anything. And the person I am is the, the, the addition, the summary of everything else that has happened, the good and the bad. And now that I am 70 years old, I, I look back and I say, what would I change? I don't think I would change anything. Of course, I would want my daughter to be alive. But I'm very happy that she lived 28 years. So uh, would I want to change the fact that she was born? No. No. And would I want to change the suffering in my life? No, because everything that I am today and the strength that I think I have comes from the bad moments, never from the joyful moments. The joyful moments don't teach you anything. It's the suffering, the, stre the, the stress, the losses that make you the person you are. So I don't, I don't think I would change anything. But things I regret, yes. I regret the men I didn't sleep with. <laughs> Out, out of virtue. Virtue is a stupid thing. <laughs> I also regret the times that I hurt people. I don't think that I, I wanted to hurt them, but I did. Uh, that I regret. I really do. Especially my first husband. He didn't deserve it. I'm a good guy, actually. You, you said that uh, after the memoir, Paula, that research saved you from writer's block. Can you talk about that? Well, after my daughter died, my daughter died after being a year in a coma. So and we took care of her at home. So it was a, a terrible year in which every day was exactly like the previous day and exactly like the following day. Nothing changed. And by the end of the year when Paula died, I had the feeling that I couldn't remember anything, that I couldn't separate the days. And then my mother gave me back 180 letters that I had written to her. And in the letters, it was day by day what had happened. So I could see the events chronologically and understand it better. And I wrote that book, Paula. And after I finished that book, there was nothing else to do. There was this emptiness. My life was totally empty. And um, I was in a writer's block for like three years. I would, every single day, sit down to write, and I just could not. Nothing would come up. And if I could write a sentence, the next day I would throw it away because it was terrible. And then I remember, well, I went to have a coffee in, in Book Passage, a coffee shop, and a bookstore. And I met Annie Lamott, who is a very popular writer in the Bay Area. And she said, how are you doing? And I said, terrible. I can't write at all. I'm, I'm in a writer's block. And she said, there's no such a thing as a writer's block. You're just empty. Your reservoirs are empty. Fill them up. And then I remembered that I'm a journalist by training. And if I give myself an assignment, I can write about almost anything except politics and football. <laughs> so I gave myself an assignment that would be as removed from loss and, and death and illness and sadness as possible. And so I decided to write about aphrodisiacs. And aphrodisiacs are the bridge between the two only deadly sins that are worth the trouble. <laughs> Gluttony and lust. <laughs> and so I'm researching about food and researching about Last eroticism brought me back to my body. It was a very, very lovely time because my mother was visiting. My mother thought that I was in such a bad uh, state that she had to come and take care of me. So she came, this little old lady, and we would go to the pawn shops in the gay district in <laughs> San Francisco. My mother speaks very little English. So uh, we would look at these devices. <laughs> rubber devices. And my mother said, what's that? And I would read the instructions. So put on my glasses, read the instructions, and translate to my mother. The, the so it was a really wonderful time. I remember there was, there was a, a seat that was like a chaise long. 
and you would sit in this thing like this and press buttons and it would vibrate in strategic places. <laughs> and at the beginning you sit, you know, at the end of the chair and you're very, very shy. And then at the end my mother was like that. <laughs> to write on those days when you just might not feel like writing. Before, I used to go there and do it, and then and either correct, research, um, or write, and then I knew that it was not worth writing, but I would do it. Now I'm more, I'm kinder to myself. And now I think that I have to live, and I have, I have a life, and I may go shopping instead. <coughs> So, uh, I, I'm not as strict as I was before, but I do like writing. So, for me, it's not a job. I really love it. Well, but now, you, you did, took a sabbatical this last year, didn't you? I took a sabbatical because everybody said that I had to stop writing, that, that I had been writing too much, that I was stressed. You know, people talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, I took a sabbatical with the idea that, what do you do in a sabbatical if you don't have a project? And that year, my husband got sick. So my project was to take care of Willie, which is very boring. He didn't die, so it wasn't even worth it. <laughs> and so now he's doing fine, and I wasted, wasted a year of my life. <laughs> no, no, go on. Are, are there any new Latin American writers you read and recommend? Me. <laughs> I would have never been this. Like Did you know Eva Luna before you met her? Actually, Eva Luna is my third novel that I wrote in Venezuela. It's a very Venezuelan book, very, very Caribbean book. And I knew a person who inspired the book. She was a um, primitive artist, a painter, and uh, um, she, Elsa Morales, and she, she died unfortunately. She was a wonderful woman, and many of the stories of the beginning of Eva Luna are based on her life. And then later the book took over and it ended up being something quite different. But she inspired it. How has exile shaped your writing? Exile, uh, I wouldn't call it exile. I would say that I have all my life I have been an outsider. First, because I've never fit in anywhere as a child. And then because <clears throat> I am a child of diplomats, so we kept moving from one place to another. I was always the new kid in, in school. I, I would make friends and then you have to leave them. Then I became a, pol a political refugee after the military coup in Chile. And then I married an American and became an immigrant. So all my life has been about living in places where I don't quite belong. And it takes a tremendous effort to understand the clues of that place and try to fit in. And I never quite do. And I think that that's very good for a writer because it forces you to, uh, to look at things from, from a different angle. When I go to Chile, it seems to me that everything is known, that, that I understand everything. There's nothing new. And when I am in the United States and I've been here for 25 years, I don't get it. For me, Republicans and Democrats are the same. <laughs> I, I don't understand most of the rules. I, don't, I, lo I loved it, the, the woman that writes your blog was talking about you doing the Super Bowl. And, and she made, what did you make for the Super Bowl? It's Some not, Chilean food. So I, I had no idea that you eat pizza, pizza and <laughs> hamburgers and, and beer. I cooked for three days. Chacan, <laughs> cazuela, empanadas, all kinds of stuff that everybody looked at it with disgust. <laughs> so I never fit in. I don't understand Thanksgiving. Why people eat that bird that tastes like towels? <laughs> and, and all the stuff that they put in it. It's just disgusting. 
But here, here was what I love, was the comment you were, you were wondering why everybody was fighting over this ball. Why didn't they just all get their own ball? Go <laughs> home! <laughs> I have a couple questions here. For, I'm going to revert back to my own because I'm selfish. Um, in, in, in Paoli, you said about the House of the Spirits that other voices were speaking through me. Uh, does that still happen? Yes, I think that I, it happens to you too. It happens to every, every writer that we start with an idea. We start with a character. With, we start with the, with, the, with the idea that we control the character and we want to tell this story in this way. And then things happen. And the characters do other things and they take over and the story goes in another direction. And you never know how it's going to end. And then one day you come to end the story and you realize that it ended two days before. And everything you've written since then is worth thrown away. Well, you know, I have a friend who's a, a, a writer, and she's also a lucid dreamer. And she Me was, too. Oh, really? Yeah, I write down the, dream, the dreams. Oh, God, I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just for, she, she would uh, go to bed at night, and she would dream the next chapter Absolutely. of her novel and get up and write it down. Absolutely. <laughs> you do that? Yeah, I do that, but, but also the dreams keep telling me things. Uh, when I write, and only when I'm writing, I have dreams of babies. And the question, Willie, my husband, discovered that the baby is the book. And that whatever happens to the baby in the dream is happening to the book in real life and I haven't seen it. And I will give you an example that happened with uh, my second uh, young adult book, um, The Kingdom of the Golden Dragon. Uh, I finished the book, sent it away, the editor saw the book, it was translated, it, it was in the process of being translated. And Paige, my American translator, was doing the English translation. And I kept having this dream, this dream of a baby that was in a maze, and I could go there and couldn't retrieve the baby from the maze. And I kept telling Willie, William, I, what does this mean? And he said, well, there's something wrong with the plot of the book that I was writing in that moment, which was another book. And I said, no, because the baby is not a young baby. It's a baby. It's like a toddler. <laughs> and so it has to be a book that I've already written. It has to be a, an older book. And then I went back to the manuscript of uh, this book, and I read it again carefully. Couldn't find anything. And then in that moment, Pech sent me the translation into English. And when you read it in another language, it's a, there's a filter. You read another book. It's not your words, it's Pech words. And then I saw it. I had assumed that the protagonists had an information that determined the ending. And there was no way they could have that information. So the ending of the book was damning there, and th there was a terrible, terrible mistake there that I had not seen. And without the dream, Hammering me every night, I would have never seen it. Was it already published in Spanish? No. It was, we, we retrieved it from all the translators and changed the ending. And, but it was that, that dramatic that the dream would not leave me alone. And I married Willie because of a dream. <laughs> no, that's true. Not that I dreamed of him before, the, no. But for years and years, long before the military coup in Chile, I had nightmares of soldiers marching. And I would see only the legs of the soldiers marching in parades, and, and it was just terrifying. And the day I met Willie, I met him in San Jose with a group of people, so he wasn't particularly, he wasn't the only person that night. There was a lot of people. And that night I had the nightmare of the, the soldiers marching, but I had taken a sleeping pill, and I couldn't wake up. And I was immersed in this horrible nightmare, and there was a golf course, and they were marching in the golf course, and there was nowhere to hide. And in that moment, a person came and stood next to me, and I hid behind this person. And then when I looked up, it was this man that I had met that day. And so when he called me and invited me for lunch the next day, I said, yes, immediately, <laughs> because I knew I had to marry him. He wasn't so sure. Well, that Allende means... The other side, doesn't it? Yeah, far away. Ah, oh, I was thinking. I was thinking more metaphysical. I go beyond, beyond, the other side. beyond. Yeah. Does your name? Does that have any significance for you? Maybe because I'm always beyond everything. 
talking about writing, but when I, one of the things that I admire so much about you is that you're using your power and your, your resources to make this difference in the world for, for women that are less well protected than, than we are. And, and I'm wondering if you would, would talk about the, the foundation of just a little bit. First, I, I have to say that I have been a feminist since before the word was invented. I was like five years old, and no one knew it. Really. Imagine, Chile in the 40s. It was the most conservative, the most Catholic, patriarchal, authoritarian society and family in, in which you could ever be born. And that was where I was born. And um, I, I always knew that there was something wrong. So why was it that my mother was a victim and the men around me had all the power? So I was very, very young, a child, and I knew that there was something wrong. And so I, I was enraged, very young, and nobody knew what the heck was wrong with me. They would take me to the doctor to see that if, if they could give me some pills to calm me down. But it didn't calm down, and by age 15 I was a raging feminist. But before feminists reached Chile, and then the bill was invented, and then there was the women's labor, and everybody was talking about this, and then it, it was a movement in the world. And I knew that there was nothing wrong with me. It was, there was many, many women in the world that were already thinking and feeling what I was thinking and feeling. So I, I sort of, for once, I thought, oh my God, I fit in. There's somebody else that thinks like me. So all my life was about empowering women, about working for women, about women. This doesn't mean that I don't like men. I love men. Men have been very, very clever to make feminists look like hairy bitches. <laughs> very clever. Let me tell you, ladies, there is nothing more sexy than being a feminist. So, please. Yeah. Once, after Paula died, and I wrote that book, I started, amazingly, the book did well. And uh, it became a bestseller, and the checks started to come in. And I didn't want to touch that money because the, no, it wasn't the idea to make money on, on something like that. So I put all that in a separate bank account, thinking, how am I going to use this money so that my daughter would feel pleased with this? And it stayed there for a while. And then I did a trip to India. And I was in India with my husband and a friend, and we were uh, in Rajasthan, going by car, in, uh, somewhere in a rural place, far away from everything. And in the middle of nowhere, the car got very hot, we had to stop to cool the engine. And there was an acacia tree far away, and a few women there. So my friend and I, we walked toward the women. And you know how it is, when in, in other cultures, we don't have this distance, you know, that you, people touch, and they come very, very close. People are like in your face. So we didn't share a language, but we could sort of touch. And my friend had red hair, so they were touching her hair. And we had bought bracelets in the market, so we, we had, I don't know, artfuls of bracelets. We gave the bracelets to the women. It was just lovely. And then the car was ready, and the uh, driver honked, and it was time to go. So when we were leaving, one of the women touched me and, and gave me something. And I thought that she was giving me something back for the bracelets. I said, no, 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 it's not necessary. And, and she insisted. And so she gave me this little package of rags. And I sort of opened the rags, and there was a newborn baby inside. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I, I didn't know why she had given it. So I blessed the baby and kissed the baby and tried to give it back, and she sort of backed off. So uh, in that moment, the driver came running, and he took the baby from me and gave it back to the mother and, and pushed me to the car. And so when I realized what had happened, I was already in the car and we were driving away. And finally, when I could speak, I said, why would she give me her baby? And, she, and the driver said, it was a girl. Who wants a girl? 
And that was a moment, the moment when I, I realized, in that, in that sentence, it was everything that I have tried to say all my life. I have tried to say how, how we don't value the feminine, how we don't value women, the violence against, against women, the exploitation, the abuse. Now that we have the technology to know uh, the, the gender of, of a child before it's born, millions of girls go missing because they are aborted before they even have a chance because they are girls, because boys are more valued than girls. And so I knew what I was going to do with that money, create a foundation to empower women and girls. I couldn't do for that, I couldn't save that little girl, but at least I could help some other girl's baby. And so I started like that, and a couple of years later, my son, um, my son, what? Well, my son's wife turned out to be gay. So she fell in love with my stepson's fiance. So it was a mess. It was a mess. And if you want to read about it, read the Sum of Our Days. Well, and so my son was left with three babies in diapers alone. What would any mother do? Look for a bride. And so I started looking for a bride that would fit my son's needs and mine. <laughs> I needed someone to run the foundation and to run my life. So I found Lori, who is sitting there. She married my son. <laughs> And she turned around this little foundation, which has grown all these years. And she is the one who goes to Nepal, to India, to wherever is needed. And she looks for the little organizations that are saving little girls from brothels in India, that are saving little girls from servitude, indented servitude in Nepal, who, saving girls that, or, or women in Mexico or in other places. And so that's what my foundation does. And it's been a, a wonderful support. Thank you, Isabel.